So um, people probably just keep trickling in, but we always try to start right on time with these because we only have 45 minutes and we try to get you out right at 745 um, with time at the end to answer questions. Um, so I'm Emily Murphy Core for those of you who I haven't met before. Um, and I run Say2 Vermont, um, a wellness retreat center located in Southern Vermont in Brattleboro. Um, and we've been, since we've been shut down for COVID, we've actually started a bunch of online opportunities, which has been really fun and a way to engage everybody um, and to stay engaged with this wonderful material. So tonight we have Lynn Pike, who's an Ayurvedic health counselor who's joining us. You may have seen her before if you joined um, an earlier lecture as she has presented before. Um, and she did Ayurvedic mocktails last time and you got to have a bunch of recipes. Um, and tonight she'll be doing Ayurveda for the skin. So um, it's a nice time for you to learn a little bit about how Ayurveda looks at the skin. Um, it analyzes skin um, care in general, um, what they recommend, and you're gonna learn how to make a few different skin masks. So um, that'll be really fun. Um, and yeah, you can share them with your friends, share them with your partners, um, post them on Facebook, we'd love to see them. So um, I'll let Lynn jump right, oh, let me just say one more thing is, we will, I will be monitoring the chat. If a question comes up that you have during the lecture, I think this is how Lynn's gonna run it and she can correct me after if, if I'm wrong. Um, during, she'll just kind of keep going through. You're welcome to type some questions in the chat if you have them, um, but she'll be addressing questions towards the end just so we kind of streamline things. Um, so without further ado, Lynn can introduce herself a little bit more and we're just so happy to have her. So awesome, let's get started. Thank you. Hi, um, so welcome to Ayurveda Skin Care. Um, and thank you again, Emily. And just a reminder that everyone will be muted until the end and we will accept questions when we have our, our dialogue at the end. So um, this is me, I'm Lynn Pike. Um, just in case maybe you weren't at the previous um, lecture. This is my family, <laughs> this is me with my family. Um, I've been a yogi for over 20 years and my exposure to Ayurveda began 15 years ago. So I have my 200 YTT yoga teacher certification and I also earned my advanced yoga teacher training um, in Boston. I studied under Natasha Rosopoulos for both. Um, I'm also a graduate of the Kapala School of Ayurveda with Emily as a certified Ayurvedic health counselor, it's how we met. And in addition to all of this, I have been skincare consulting on the side for almost 10 years, which is, I'm realizing is kind of a long time. So um, my email is at the bottom, just in case anybody wants to reach out. So the topic tonight, like we said, is Ayurvedic skincare. Now, usually when we hear the word skincare, we think just of our face. Um, and just of the skin on our face, but um, we're going to focus on the entire, the care of our skin and skin covers our entire body, right? It's our largest organ. And so we have two takeaways tonight, tips for whole body skincare and tips for your face and your face skincare. So Ayurveda, first, let's begin by defining Ayurveda. Um, Ayurveda is most commonly translated as the science of life. The science of life. Ayu or Ayus means life. And Veda, in this case, is translated as science. But Veda also means wisdom, knowledge, and truth. And so the word science in this context is much more encompassing than how we traditionally use the word. So science, we think biology, uh, microbiology, chemistry, and Ayurveda is all of those things and so much more. Um, in addition to anatomy, physiology, epidemiology, Ayurveda encompasses herbology, um, psychology, philosophy, astrology, spirituality. So to study Ayurveda and to study the science of life is to study everything, right? Ayurveda is the study of everything. Um, and so in that way, Ayurveda is all encompassing because everything you experience makes up your life, right? Everything you experience, not one thing here or there. Um, 
And so this brings us to the concept of wholeness. So there is no isolation in Ayurveda. There's no segregation, there's no separation. There's only wholeness. And so it's through this lens of wholeness that we will dive into the four main components of life and we'll review and define Dinacharya. So the body, the mind, the soul, and the senses are the four main components of life, according to Ayurveda. And we're going to carry the concept of wholeness with us throughout this lecture. And so you think, um, you know, the body, the physical plane, the mind, the mental plane, the soul, the spiritual plane. And then you think the five senses, <laughs> you're like, wait, really? The five senses? Yes, it's one of the four main components of life, according to Charaka Samhita, which is one of the main ancient Ayurvedic texts. Charaka says, without the constant connection of these four components, life cannot exist. Life can't exist at all. So let's talk about the five senses then, because I think the other ones make sense. Um, and then we're like, kind of left thinking, well, what does that mean with the five senses? So how many senses do we have? We have five, right? We all learned that a long time ago. Our eyes are for our sight, our tongue for taste, your nose to smell, your ears to hear, and your skin for touch. And these are called your ganendrias in Sanskrit. Okay, these are your sense organs. So according to Chetika Samhita, it's our five senses are what connects our body and our mind and our soul. It's our five senses that creates this union and our experience of wholeness comes from our five senses. And why? Well, because it's through our five senses that we perceive everything. We're perceiving information and we're transforming what we perceive into knowledge and awareness. So our five senses are the bridge to our higher consciousness. They are the gateway to your awareness. They're the thread that connects all these planes of existence, everything that you are. And this is how you experience wholeness. So we have a few questions for you and we thought it might be fun to write in the chat box and Emily said she's gonna manage the chat. So we just had a couple of questions that we thought would be kind of fun to engage in. So. The first one, and it's not going to be hard, but where are most of your senses located? And just go ahead and type it in the chat and Emily will read them out loud. And what part of your body are most of your sense organs located? Lisa said the head. She was the first to respond. <laughs> Yay! You used the chat before. Okay, <laughs> correct. Yes, it's our face, our head. What does this reveal to you? Why do you think this is important? What is the importance of that? What do you think? Just type it in the chat. So we have a few heads, then we had skin, temperature, and pressure. Oh. Oh, interesting. Somebody said it's closest to the brain, the control yep. center, close to right. the brain. Right. Yep. <laughs> yep. Exactly. Exactly. What is in our head, right? Our brain, our mind. Exactly. This is where all of the information we're perceiving is going. It's going right into our mind. This is where we are transforming knowledge. It's in our mind. This is where we transform emotions into higher consciousness and and awareness. So the last question is currently in your life, what are you doing to keep your sense organs clean? Do you have a sense care practice in your life right now? And you can just type it in the chat. It could be anything. Britta said she's tongue scraping. Oh, good. Lisa yeah. is working on it. What does working on it Lisa mean? <laughs> she's brushing her teeth. No, she didn't type that. Um, Angelica gave me a shout out, but what, what do you do, Angelica? Just write it in the chat. Because some people are new to Ayurveda in this lecture. Other people may have sense care routines. So some things, especially if you have something that's related to the skin, maybe. Um, right. Rose water and eyes. Great. Great. 
Let's see here. Lisa said oil on the skin and scalp. Oh, great. Maybe if we didn't hear from Aaron or Isabel, I'm sure you guys are doing something, at least brushing <laughs> the teeth or maybe you take showers and Joy, what do you do? <laughs> uh, bet Isabel said she does bet betonite clay, which we're going to oh. talk a little bit. Um, nice. Lisa said drops in the eyes and ears. Oh, wow. You guys Angelica's are... doing tongue scraping, rose water spits to cool and oil pulling. Yeah. This is excellent. Jessica. And there's more. Oh, okay. Awesome. Um, if you have, if you have any last ones, just type them in quickly and then we'll. Wow. On. So it seems like people are doing a diverse amount of stuff and yeah. I'm really happy to hear some of these things. <laughs> I thought someone was just going to write brushing my teeth, but these are advanced. Gazing at beauty. Okay. <laughs> Beautiful oh things. Okay. Good. What a nice group. This group is very positive. Yeah. This is a positive group. Excellent. Wow. That's beautiful. Okay. Well, this brings us right into Dinacharya, right? Dinacharya. Some of you might have heard this word before. Some of you might not know what it means. So translated, it means your daily regimen for self-care. Okay. So we're going to slide now right into Dinacharya from, from the five senses. Okay. Now we live alongside the rhythms of nature. We are nature. So just like the tides and the moon and the sun have natural rhythms, so do we, right? And sometimes we forget that, but so do we. And when we live alongside these rhythms, we maintain optimal health. It's one of the goals of Ayurveda. So, so what else, what falls under this concept of Dinacharya, but taking care of your sense organs, daily cleansing of of your senses and your sense organs, right? Daily. It's really important. So examples, some of these examples of Dinacharya were everything you just wrote down. You're doing it. This is fantastic. In addition to, yeah, Nasya, Neti, Abhyanga, um, rose water. These are all examples, just like you gave of Dinacharya. And so when would you do these things? Okay, so according to the ancient texts of Ayurveda, um, they recommend that you clean your sense organs when you first wake up in the morning. And why? Why would you do that? And why would you even do it then or do it at all? Well, because it will support your balance, your harmony, your well-being, your immunity. It does all of these things. So what's the point of doing this? Cleaning your sense organs creates a clearer pathway for correct perception, correct interpretation, correct transformation of information that we are perceiving and receiving from the outside world. So we're bringing in information all the time, all the time. And when we clean our sense organs, we're creating a pathway for correct perception because we're gonna perceive anyway. We want it to be as correct as possible because we will transcend this perception into into higher consciousness and, and awareness, okay? That is Dinacharya. So skin care falls right under Dinacharya, the whole part of Dinacharya. Skin care, the largest organ of your whole body. So we're gonna discuss whole body skin care first. Some examples, Garshana, Abhyanga, bathing. We're gonna spend most of our time on bathing but some of you might not have heard these other words. Garshana, dry brushing. It's a way to exfoliate, increase circulation. You literally take a dry brush on your skin. Abhyanga is full body oil massage. This is so important. Now we're not gonna get into that tonight because there was a previous lecture on this, but Abhyanga slows down the aging process. It nourishes your whole body. It improves your strength. It improves your immunity. It increases your resistance to disease. So it's more than just moisturizing, although of course it is as well. So if you wanna learn more about Abhyanga, how to choose the right oil, what to use, how to apply it, you can actually view Satu Vermont's free lecture. It's titled At Home Spa Evening. Emily hosted that, At Home Spa Evening. And you can get all the information about Abhyanga in there. So after Garshana, after Abhyanga, after Dinacharya is when you bathe. 
bathing is showering or taking a bath. It doesn't mean you have to take a bath. It's showering or taking a bath. Now, according to the ancient texts of Ayurveda, it's daily bathing, <laughs> right? Daily bathing, because it's not only cleansing. According to Ayurveda, bathing is not just cleansing, but it improves your mental and physical strength. Mentally, bathing increases the sattva of your mind. Sattva is the clear, balanced essence of your mind, so it will increase peace. Um, it will increase those qualities of your mind. Physically, bathing improves your vitality, your longevity, your immunity. It enkindles your agni. What is agni? Just in case you don't know, it's your digestive fire. Agni is responsible for digestion, assimilation, absorption, and transformation of all the matter and energy in your body. And your main central fire is located in your stomach area. This is the Agni they're talking about in kindling with bathing. So this is still under Dinacharya, right? So there's rules. We have some rules about bathing. The ideal scenario is that you would bathe in the morning before breakfast on an empty stomach. On an empty stomach will help enkindle your Agni. And they rec Ayurveda recommends you eat no later than eight in the morning. The second rule is to always bathe on an empty stomach. That's why you bathe before breakfast. Now, if you can't bathe before you eat, you just need to wait at least two hours after you eat. You don't wanna bathe right, right after. It will impede your digestion and it can even tax your digestive system. Okay, so we're gonna jump now into some Ayurvedic baths. So, we have rejuvenating baths we're going to talk about. We'll go over two. We're going to talk about jasmine and marigold. And the basic template for both of these baths would be to use warm water, one to two eight ounce cups of either fresh or dried flowers, jasmine and marigold, or marigold, right? One or the other, or both. I'm sure you could mix it up too. If you want to use dry, you can get a sachet or some type of cheesecloth because otherwise the dried petals will start to disintegrate and kind of get everywhere. If you don't have access to flowers, you can use essential oils. You could try a jasmine, four to seven drops in your, in your bath. And then you wanna soak. You want to soak from 20 to 40 minutes. You wanna just get the bath ready, get in your bath and soak. And it's so, so, so good. To, to be able to have the time to do this, okay? So now let's jump into jasmine. Jasmine's more of a restorative bath. The gunas, gunas mean qualities of jasmine are light and slimy. So lagu and snigda, okay? Now jasmine flowers are considered to be auspicious, which means favorable. They were often given to the gods as gifts. So that's a cool, interesting part of jasmine. So jasmine is also antifungal, antibacterial. It heals skin wounds, but it also soothes headaches and reduces mental tension. It's a great way to reduce stress. It's a very nurturing and nourishing bath for your whole body. And jasmine has special healing properties for all of your five senses, not just your skin. So it's all your five senses and it protects and detoxifies your skin. It also balances all three doses. There are only three. There are only three. So that means jasmine is great for all people in all seasons, all the time. It's also a really, really easy indoor plant to keep. So you can have an outdoor jasmine, you can have an indoor jasmine plant. Everyone should have a jasmine plant. And if you don't have one yet, you just start off with essential oils. And then we'll move into marigold. So the marigold bath is more of a healing bath, okay? The qualities of marigold are, um, the gunas are lagu and vruksha, so they're light and dry. Now marigold is highly, highly, highly healing. It's highly antimicrobial, antifungal, it's antiseptic, antiviral, antibacterial, antiparasitic, anti-anti, it's so amazing. It's anti-inflammatory and it's also antioxidant. It purifies, purifies your blood, it heals skin wounds. So this bath is great for fungal issues or if you have hemorrhoids 
post childbirth sutures. This is a fantastic bath. It's extremely healing, but you don't need to have hemorrhoids to use this bath because it has so many benefits for your skin as well, right? So you can, you can enjoy a marigold bath for um, the beautiful benefits it has on your skin. It imparts glow. It keeps wrinkles at bay. It clears up acne. It soothes your skin. It reduces redness, prevents dryness. It reduces oiliness. And it's also healing for all of your sense organs. So these two baths are a full and complete sensory experience. It's not just, you're not just getting this great benefit for your skin, but you're getting this amazing clarity for all of your sense organs and you're affecting the quality of your mind because you're increasing sattva, right? So remember, you're increasing the peace and the content and the calmness of your mind with these baths as well. So let's just jump into soaps. We have three base soaps we're going to go over today. These soaps we're going to talk about are great for your face and your body, which is fantastic. And you may use all of them daily. So first what we'll do is we'll review the basic recipe on how to make your soap, and then we'll go into more detail on each flower. So we have three we're going to end up talking about. Green gram is lentil flour. Green gram flour, chickpea flour, and red lentil flour. And the recipe is the same for each. So when you're making your soap for your bath or your shower, you take a half a cup of flour and one tablespoon of water. And you want it to be a pretty thick paste. So add your water slowly to get the right consistency that you're looking for. Um, Make this before your bath or your shower, right? And have it ready, have it ready for you. At the end of your bath, so after you've soaked for like 40, 45 minutes maybe, then you take your pre-mixed soap that you have probably in this gorgeous bowl waiting for you and you can use it on your body and your face as a scrub. But what you wanna do is you wanna stand up and then you'd scrub your body and then sit down and rinse in the bath. Or you can stand up and scrub and then rinse off in the shower, turn the shower on. Because if you're sitting in your bath and try to scrub, it will dissolve, right? Because it's just flour. So it will kind of disintegrate. So don't sit in your bath and try and scrub. Make sure you stand up. So let's go over the three soaps or the bases, excuse me, the flowers. So we have green gram flour. Again, green uh, mung lentil is how you might see it as well. And the gunas, the qualities would be light and dry for all three of these flowers, lagu and luksha. So green gram flower is fantastic. It's the best base for all people. It's great for all skin types. It's gently exfoliating. It maintains your natural moisture barrier of your skin and it clarifies your complexion. It removes whiteheads. It's cooling. So um, green gram is extremely common. And then chickpea flour. Chickpea flour, again, is lagu and buksha. This is for if you want an instant glow, you would use chickpea. It can lighten your complexion. It can help with uneven skin tone. It's great for dull skin, but it also reduces acne and can absorb excess oil and it's cooling. Red lentil flour, again, lagu and ruksha, is the best for oily, acne prone, blemish prone skin. Okay, it controls the sebum production, the oil production of your skin. So it counteracts acne and it's also cooling and soothing. It's fantastic. So now we'll move into the face masks or face pack. You'll see that as well with Ayurveda, face pack. So I just want to remind you that as we move into the face mask part, the three soaps we just talked about, the green lentil flour, the chickpea, and the red lentil, you can use them as a face mask, okay? As a really basic general face mask. Take one tablespoon of the flour, and then you decide what type of skin you have. If you, have, if you lean towards oily skin, you could use, mix it with water. Again, you want it to be really thick. So just a little bit of water until you get the consistency you want. If you have sensitive skin, combination skin, acne, that means you have pitta skin. So you could use water, but aloe vera would be very cooling. And that would be um, a really great cooling agent for pitta skin. You could mix it with a little aloe. 
And then if you have dry or extremely dry skin, your vata. So you would mix that base flour with some drops of sesame oil. And then you want that thick, thick paste and you spread it all over your face. And then remember, these are safe to use daily or weekly. You can use them every day or a couple times a week. So you spread it all over your face and you want them to dry but not crack. That's when you've left it on too long. So you want them to dry and then you rinse them off and you can finish with a moisturizer or a face oil. So those are like the, that's kind of like the general, the basic face masks. But now we'll go into four different face masks that have more ingredients, okay? So we have the Radiant Face Pack. The Radiant Face Pack is used with Indian Healing Clay. Indian Healing Clay is also known as Multani Miti, Fuller's Earth, and Bentonite Clay. That's all, it's all the same, okay? You can find it on Amazon. It removes toxins and impurities. It improves the skin's circulation. It softens your skin. It reduces scarring. It reduces acne. It absorbs excess oil. It's, a, it's gentle exfoliating, and it makes your skin smooth and supple. And then you have yogurt, which is an exfoliator, a gentle exfoliator. It reduces wrinkles. Honey. Honey heals acne and boosts collagen. It also helps with eczema and can heal small abrasions. Lemon juice is an astringent, high in vitamin C. It's an antioxidant. It can reduce premature aging. And so this is, these are the ingredients for, for this face pack. Um, four teaspoons of Indian healing clay, two teaspoons of yogurt, two teaspoons of raw honey, one teaspoon of lemon juice, and then remember you're adding them slowly, the lemon juice and the honey, you're just adding them slowly to make sure the honey will make it nice and sticky. Um, but you just wanna make sure it's like the right consistency for you. And then you would leave it on for about 10 minutes. With Indian Healing Clay, if you have more sensitive skin, you can leave it on for less time. And if you have more normal skin, you can leave it on a little bit longer. You can leave it on for around 10 minutes, then you rinse it off with lukewarm water. Then we have the Indian Ubatan. This is the before wedding mask, the traditional before wedding mask. This uses green gram. Remember green gram is the green lentil powder, which clarifies your complexion, the gentle exfoliation, you remove those whiteheads. It's also, it rejuvenates your skin. It brightens the texture of your skin. It's loaded with vitamins A and C, which help give your skin a beautiful glow. And then there's turmeric powder. Turmeric is so good for your skin. It's anti-inflammatory, antibacterial. It gets all the junk out of your pores. It unclogs your pores. It fades scars. It heals acne and it calms your skin. And then yogurt again and lemon juice and then rose water. Rose water maintains the pH balance of your skin. It can reduce the redness and irritation. It controls excess oils. It also unclogs pores and it reduces acne eczema, dermatitis. So these, these, all these ingredients are amazing. So you basically put together four teaspoons of green gram lentil powder, one to two of turmeric, one teaspoon of yogurt, and then a teaspoon of rose water. Again, making sure it's thick enough for your face. And then you want it, and that's why it's this beautiful golden color is because of the turmeric. And then you leave it on to dry. Don't let it crack. Leave it on 10, 15 minutes, and then you can rinse it off with lukewarm water. And then the Healthy Skin Face Pack. This has the chickpea base. Chickpea will lighten your complexion. You get that glow from chickpea, but it also soothes inflamed skin and it can help control oil as well. You get that instant glow from chickpea flour. The turmeric powder that we've talked about. And then amla. This one has amla. It's extremely high in vitamin C. Amla is Indian gooseberry, but you're using the powder. and uh, brightens your complexion, it tones, tightens, and softens your skin. And then you can use milk or water. You would use milk for dry skin. And then water is fine for all skin. But if you have really dry skin, you could use milk. And then the rose water. So you'd have two teaspoons of chickpea flour, an eighth a teaspoon of turmeric, a quarter teaspoon of amla, milk or water, right, to make 
nice and thick, and then a little bit of rose water to make the paste. And then again, you leave it on until it dries, not cracks. And you can leave it on for 10, 15 minutes, and then you rinse it off. And then we have the summertime face pack. So this is great for all skin types, and it's really great for summer because it's hydrating and it's cooling. The tip is for the avocado. Now, I tried this one out. Emily, Emily did the other face mask. So when you have questions, she can answer personal how it went for her. I did this face mask and it came out like guacamole because I used a fork and I didn't puree it. And I actually ate it after it was delicious. But anyway, the, the point is you should puree your avocado. So you're going to need to really um, use a blender and then, uh, which is very nourishing for your skin, the avocado, the coconut milk is, is cooling. And then it's just a little coconut milk, one eighth of a cup. And then a teaspoon of castor oil. If you don't have castor, you can use sesame. And again, you really want to be a thick paste so that the avocado is heavy. You don't want it to fall down. So um, make it nice and thick. Um, and then after you wipe it off, you rinse with cool water. So wipe it off with a washcloth because it's thick and avocado-y. And then rinse with cool water. And then you can spray your face with rose water. So we've mentioned rose water a little bit. You know, what is rose water? So rose water is made from organic roses and that are steam distilled. So it's roses. It's not essential oils. You're, you are not, you should never put essential oils in your eyes. That um, would be awful. So make sure that you know exactly what the ingredients are in your rose water and that it's organic and it's just roses and water. That's what you want. Um, so what's great is it's like a toner, rose water. It's extremely cooling. You don't have to put it on just after you do a face pack. You can use rose water anytime, maybe after a long day in front of the computer. It's very refreshing. Um, and then let's see what we have next. So these are, so we're wrapping up. So we have the tips. So I just wanted you to know where I got some of these things from if you're looking for a good brand, for example. Um, Rosewater Heritage Store, also the Kripalu store at, at Kripalu sells really great rose water. If you wanted essential oils from your, for your bath, these are three companies that are, that are good companies to choose from, unless you want to choose your own. And I love these two books. One is Ayurveda Lifestyle Wisdom that I love. And it's beautiful. It's a beautiful cover. And she talks about a lot of skincare in there and a lot of basic dinacharya. And then there's this one, Absolute Beauty by another Ayurvedic doctor. And I just wanna make sure you had those two resources just because they're beautiful books and I've enjoyed them. So I just wanted to make sure you had, you had those in writing um, for yourself. And that's it. And now we can move on to any questions anybody has. So people should feel free to just unmute themselves as they have questions and um, just ask them directly rather than typing them in the chat. Unless you feel shy, you can type them in the chat and I'll voice them. <laughs> I have a couple questions. Um, does the turmeric in the face mat packs stain your skin? Great question. If you use a lot yeah. of turmeric, it um, could leave like a, a little hue behind, but um, Emily demoed all of these face packs um, and she was very sweet. And she said that um, she said that she had very fair skin herself, and it did not stain because she used an eighth of a teaspoon in the um, ingredients. And she said because it was that amount, she didn't get any staining on her face. But turmeric, if used in a high quantity, like a lot, absolutely could like stain your your sink. Yeah, and then that's awesome. So then the and then the three grain, the flowers, is there specifically? for a specific dosha, like the green gram versus mm. the chickpea? Well, in, that's a great question. So the interesting part is the way skin is kind of 
aligned with dosha is if you have dry skin, you have vata skin. If you have sensitive or combination or acne, you have pitta skin, pitta. And if you have, you know, the normal to oily, really the oily, that would be kapha. And so based on those skin types is the dosha that you are. And so, for example, green gram is so great because it's great for all skin types. Okay. So that means it's for all doshas, right? And um, I didn't see any literature anywhere saying that that the red lentil or the chickpea were only for certain doshas. They just said like what they kind of help best with. So, for example, the red lentil is so great for acne mm. that it's probably like really great for a pitta outbreak or for pitta, but it doesn't mean that you know, any dosha couldn't use it. It's more aligned in that way. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Okay. Now, I have a question. Um, as far as the spritz, um, I, I really love it, but I can't keep my eyes open. They just protect me. <laughs> Is it still beneficial? I mean, I love the yeah. um, cure and all this, but it just doesn't go into the open eyes at all. <laughs> so, yeah, that's okay. For protective. <laughs> yeah, no, that's totally okay. Yeah, it totally does. Even a little bit, even if you're you, even if you're blinking, and it, and it's so beneficial for the skin on your face as well. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously, I getting you know. Um, if your eye were irritated and you wanted to get it more in your eye, that would that would be cooling for your eyes. But um, or if they were red after a long day on the computer, but um, I'm sure it just that happens to me a lot too. I just spray it and then I just start blinking and I and a little bit goes in and that's plenty. You certainly don't want it too close and you don't want to just hold the eye open and yeah, you don't want to do yeah, you don't want to do that. Yeah. Okay. Clarify. Thank yeah, you. Sure. Any other questions from, I know one person mentioned, I think it was Isabel, not to put her on the spot, but she had mentioned she used bentonite clay. So I wonder, um, you know, are you making some skin packs or, you know, maybe you're going to be wanting to try to add some of these ingredients. We'd love to hear from you. Just to unmute. Well, she... Yep. Okay. There you go. Can you hear me? Yep. <laughs> Am I? Oh, okay. Um, yeah, no, I'm definitely going to add some of these things. Definitely. Cause I'm just doing it regular vet night clay. Um, so yeah, I'll add these, these things that were mentioned. <laughs> cool. <laughs> <That's my plan. laughs> um, Aaron also asked what she's really excited to try these face masks. She asked what kind of yogurt would you recommend for these masks? I would use whole organic. What did you use, Emily? How did you feel about it? I use, I only have cream on the top or yogurt <laughs> I make. So I just use that, not, you know, I mean, it is organic. I use seven sisters. It's either seven stars or seven sisters. I forget what one it's called, but it's popular up here in Vermont. Obviously you're not in Vermont, but you, I'm sure you could find some kind of cream on top or one that's not been as processed. Other questions from folks, either about skincare things you're doing now, skincare issues you're having now, um, or other ingredients that you might want to add that maybe Lynn would have some thoughts about. I yeah, am. hi Lynn. Oh, sorry. Hi, um, thank you for this lecture. It's wonderful. Um, I was wondering about dark circles around the eyes. Oh yeah, yeah, yogurt, yogurt. yogurt? Okay. Yeah. Isn't that cool? I know. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Okay. Yeah. Whole milk organic yogurt. <laughs> Thank you. Sure. 
And I have a question about the bath temperature. If you're going to sit in it 20 to 40 minutes, what temperature do you start out with? Or do you keep adding warm water? How, tell me about temperature. Great question. That's a great question. Um, really, you just don't want it to get too cold or too hot. That's it. So if you're sitting in there for 20 minutes and you start getting chilly, I would definitely drain some of the water out and put more hot water in and keep it nice and warm. The only thing you really want to avoid is getting hot water on your, on your face and your head because right. your head is so hot already and you're protecting the hot spot that you have. So just avoid that. And then I, that's what I would do. I would just okay. maintain it. Great. Yeah. I'm going to do that because I have plenty of fresh marigolds right now in oh. the garden. So my oh. next bath will have uh, marigolds, whole marigolds. Fresh oh. <laughs> that sounds so great. Yeah, it's, I, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Sure. So Erin also asked, she said, I sometimes feel like coconut oil and even castor oil are rather thick. Would yeah, you yeah. recommend using a face wash after the masks? She said, I have acne prone skin and don't want to end up clogging the pores. Which mask? Was there a specific mask she had a question about? Is there one that has coconut oil or castor oil in it? There's one, the avocado one had castor oil or sesame, but no other one has oil. Oh, unless she's, yep, she said the no, summertime it, mask. That was the one the she was summertime. about. Yeah, with the avocado. Yeah. Mm. I, I use sesame oil on my face all the time and like straight sesame oil and I'll mix it with some essential oil sometimes. Um, but I've never, you know, broken out over it. Um, but that's a great question. I would say try it with maybe just like less oil or try it and see how you feel. Um, or maybe even omit the oil if it's something that, and just mix it with the coconut water and the, and the avocado because it will still mix. But if you wanted to like, I've never put castor oil on my face, but if you wanted then or to, to use sesame oil, based on my experience, knowing that it hasn't clogged my skin, it might make you feel better. But I don't think you need to wash your face after, after you use the face pack. Did the avocado face pack, Lynn, just to give her a little more information, did it dry, meaning on your face? Because that would suggest that it's not going to leave it like a super oil residue, or was it still pretty moist because of the amount of avocado? It was moist. Okay. I have a question. Would you, what mask would you recommend um, uh, for your moon cycle or before a little bit? Um, so are you treating the pitta type skin or even if you're more prone to kapha or vata skin type, um, Ooh, how are you aligning that? Yeah. <laughs> That's a great question. Ooh. Well, what is your skin like right before your moon cycle for you? Yeah, it's interesting. It's, it's so, it it, it, yeah. So I would just say like there, it would be me prone to breaking out more. So I was just yeah. curious if you would be then yeah your type over yeah then try the red lentil maybe okay. Since that's so great but chickpea is really really great for acne too yeah yeah so um and the green gram is very exfoliating which is also yeah. great for you know all skin so i guess all of them sound like they might be well for you and it might just be one of those things where it's personal trial and error where you get to kind of see which one you like better and which one works better for you before your moon cycle versus after versus mm -hmm. maybe at a different time oh, thank you <laughs> yeah. so we have time for probably one more question if somebody has a final question unless Britis was the final question <laughs> So we'll end here. Um, thank you so much, Lynn, for sharing all these wonderful gifts with everybody. Now you all, since you're at home and you can't enjoy the spas, yeah. it's a wonderful time to try some of Lynn's recipes. 
Um, Sunday is the, uh, uh, the full moon. Um, so you could always try and then post on our Facebook page and show us your masks. That would be really fun. Um, and then we kind of have a sharing out and Lynn will love that. Um, <laughs> anything else you wanted to say, Lynn, before we go to the last slide? No, this is great. No, okay. I'm great. So, um, thank you so much. First, I just want to rethank Lynn for um, joining us. As she said, she's an Ayurvedic health consultant um, and is establishing a practice down in the Boston area. So anybody who's down there, um, I'm sure she'll be kind of putting out information about that. Um, you have her, um, this lecture is recorded. It'll be posted on the Say2 website. Um, but additionally, it's on our Facebook page. So if you want to go back and get her um, her email contact, or maybe she can type it in the chat um, so that if anybody wants to get in contact or has some question that comes up about some of these masks. Other opportunities that are going to be coming up. So on Tuesday, August 11th, we'll be doing another free lecture. We do one a month. So this one will be on boosting immunity at the start of the school year. So for you, for those of you who are interacting with a lot of children, maybe your teachers or you know teacher friends. I know there's a lot of teachers who are worried about going back this fall. Um, you know, this could be a nice lecture for them or maybe you have kids and you're like, oh, I hope they don't, you know, bring back anything. Kids are always kind of getting sick, especially even regardless of COVID, just bringing stuff back in as they interact more and more. Um, or maybe you're just interested in immunity and you wanna come. So that'll be in August. Um, Thursday, October 8th, so this is kind of going into the fall. We'll continue the free lectures in the fall too. I just don't know the topics yet, so I'll just announce the next topic at the August one. October 8th, we're doing a two-hour seminar on seasonal routines, so if you'd like to know more on autumn routines, right, we talked a lot about the summertime this summer, um, so if you want to kind of start switching your eating patterns or, you know, learning about what kind of things you could integrate into autumn, um, that'll be a nice lecture for you. We're doing an Ayurvedic Basics weekend. Um, we're thinking that this is going to be in person. If you've taken the um, eight-hour basics already, this would, you know, you would have already taken this. Um, we did an online course, um, but if you have friends who you think would like it, they could come up for the day or, um, you know, we're going to make a weekend out of it too. So those are both options. November, we'll have Ayurvedic cooking for the fall and winter season. It'll be four sessions online. So that will be completely remote. So if you're interested in learning more about that, it ends right before Thanksgiving. So you could actually integrate a lot of the spices and recipes into your Thanksgiving meal and teach other people, right? So start to be your own little teacher um, and tell everybody about Ayurveda um, and just get them more conscious about their eating habits, right? Or at least conscious about the taste that they're taking in, right? It could be a really interesting exploration at Thanksgiving for you to say like, I'm integrating all six tastes. Do people know what those are um, and like how to um, start to experience them um, so that they feel kind of full in a holistic way. And then on December 5th, we're doing Ayurveda gift making. So this is going to be in person, hopefully, um, but we're, we're planning to do some type of maybe the December lecture too. We'll have a small component where we'll kind of share some of the things that we made so you can try it at home. Um, if you attend the in-person, then you'd obviously have, you'd make the gifts during the, the little lecture, but We'll see. I mean, some of this stuff might have to move online because we really don't know what the fall will bring. Um, but this is our plan for so far for the fall. We're so excited to see all of you. It was nice to see a lot of faces I haven't seen in a while. Um, you know, folks used to come to our meditation sessions or people who have stayed overnight with us or, you know, we're in the Ayurveda Foundation. So these are like some folks who are, um, you know, building their Ayurvedic knowledge. Um, so it's exciting to hear all the nice stuff they're doing in the chat for Dinacharya. I'm so happy for you guys. Um, so without further ado, we'll let you go because we're already a few minutes over. Thank you, Lynn, so much.